Welcome to the special video presentation of the International Journal of Communication. My name is Steve Drake. I'm an adjunct professor of communication here at the University of Maryland, where I was proud to earn both a bachelor's and a master's degree in journalism with an emphasis in public relations, studying under one of our distinguished discussants today, who we'll introduce momentarily. Today's presentation features a discussion of the Playmaker Influence Decision System. This is an ontology that gives professionals in communication, social media, public relations, sales and politics, and other professions the ability to pinpoint, manage, and measure the strategies of their marketplace. Here to present the Playmaker Influence Decision System is the creator of that system, Mr. Alan Kelly. Mr. Kelly is the author of this book called The Elements of Influence, The New Essential System for Managing Competition, Reputation, Brand, and Buzz, in which he first introduced his Playmaker Influence Decision System. Today, he's C CEO of Playmaker Systems, LLC, which is a Washington, D.C. area management consulting firm that specializes in competitive strategy and whose services and products are based on Mr. Kelly's Playmaker work. Previously, he founded and led Applied Communications Group, a San Francisco-based public relations and research firm, which was widely recognized for its work with many of Silicon Valley's best-known technology companies. He sold Applied Communications in 2003 and began his research and investigation of the topic that we're going to take a look at today. Uh, Mr. Kelly is an, is an adjunct professor of political management at George Washington University here in Washington, D.C., and he's also served as an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California Annenberg School of Communication. He holds a master's degree in communication research from Stanford and a bachelor's degree in public relations from the University of Southern California. He's a member of the Arthur W. Page Society and a senior fellow at the Society for New Communication Research. With us to offer his comments and views on the Playmaker Influence Decision System is Dr. James Grunig, Professor Emeritus with the Department of Communication here at the University of Maryland. Uh, Dr. Grunig is widely considered to be one of the preeminent researchers and theorists in public relations, certainly in our generation. In a career at the University of Maryland spanning four decades, Dr. Grunig produced research and theories which have fundamentally influenced the way public relations is planned, managed, and evaluated. Most notably, perhaps, his theory of excellence in public relations and his development of the four models of public relations. Dr. Grunig has published more than 250 articles, books, chapters, and papers, including his seminal textbook, which I learned from, Managing Public Relations. He was named the first winner of the Pathfinder Award for Excellence in Academic Research on Public Relations by the Institute for Public Relations Research and Education in 1984. He's won an uh, Outstanding Educator Award of the Public Relations Society of America. He's also uh, received in the PRSA Foundation, awarded him the Jackson, Jackson, and Wagner Award for Outstanding Behavioral Science Research. So uh, we look, thank you both for being with us. We look forward to hearing, hearing from you both. The way that uh, we're gonna proceed here is gonna ask Mr. Kelly to describe the, uh, his, the Playmaker Influence Decision System, and then Professor Grunig to comment on that afterwards. After that, we'll take a look at perhaps some real, some real world examples, take this from the classroom, if you will, to the, uh, to the laboratory, and then we'll conclude later with kind of a look to the future. So with that, Mr. Alan Kelly. Well, let me describe uh, for a few minutes uh, the, the idea I had and the, the general theory that I've advanced. Um, the, the, the influence strategy decision uh, system I have is uh, an ontology, I think it's probably referred to as an ontology of what we, what we regard as or argue are irreducibly unique stratagems. We believe of influence. We've, there's been some discussion of whether or not those are uh, stratagems of persuasion or of communication or of something else, but our, our current view is that these are elements of influence. Um, there are 24 uh, in the system that are arranged uh, under uh, a very modest strata of, of subclasses, of seven subclasses and three classes, ranging roughly from assessment to uh, conditioning to engagement. So in other words, if you, as you move left to right on what you might think of this, of, of this as a periodic table of influence, to use that metaphor, you move from very low engagement mode to a fairly high engagement mode. We believe that that uh, responsibly and exhaustively uh, covers the range and explains 
to use business parlance, the, the games or the gamesmanship or the moves and the counter moves that occur in not only in communications, uh, which we study here, of course, um, but in a variety of uh, what I call influence industries, whether it is marketing, public relations, advertising, lobbying, even even military information uh, warfare. Um, so that is the uh, the essential uh, structure. Uh, of, of the system. You can tell that it is, it, it, the centerpiece of it is the standard table of, of influence strategies and there's a variety of other subsystems that have to do with variables uh, and the way in which uh, uh, plays, if you'll accept my terminology as shorthand for influence strategies, uh, are used as, as, a, as, a, as a method of practice uh, between parties and publics. Very good. Well, thank you. Professor Grunig, I know you've had an opportunity to uh, read uh, Mr. Kelly's book and speak with him about this um, from, from your vantage point and from 40 years plus of, of researching public relations and, and strategies therein. Um, what is your overall assessment of the uh, Playmaker system? Well, the first time I, I saw the system, um, I said to Alan, where is there a possibility for collaboration? because this looks to me to be what I've called an asymmetrical approach to communication. Uh, and I've spent most of my life thinking about an alternative, which is a symmetrical approach to communication. And this would go back, I believe, to my graduate school training of approximately 1965, I believe. I took a course from a professor that we would both mutually taken classes from Stephen Chafee and uh, his mentor uh, Richard Carter who was uh, at then at the University of Wisconsin both were at the University of Wisconsin uh, Carter went on to the University of Washington and he's uh, there and retired also but it was a distinction between orientation and co-orientation and Carter at the time had written an article in which he essentially said that the concepts of persuasion and attitude were really overrated in the communication field because the whole idea seemed to be is what we do when we communicate is to try to change or influence someone else to think or behave in the way that we would like them to think. And I had grown up in a small town in Iowa that was known for its community uh, with the idea that that communication and public relations in particular is a way in which we build relationships with each other and, and, and uh, engage in dialogue with each other or co-orientation. Whereas orientation is the way one individual uh, orients himself or herself to his environment. Co-orientation is when two or more people get together and try to orient together. So basically I've seen in the playmaker system an asymmetrical form of communication and I believe very much in a symmetrical form. I asked Alan to think about that for each of his elements in his periodic table of influence was there another dimension that we might call symmetrical instead of asymmetrical in which there are other strategies that I probably wouldn't call influence strategies. I would call them relationship, I now call them relationship cultivation strategies in which we are ways of which we can relate to others and build better relationships because ultimately I think public relations is about or an organization's relationships with its publics, hence the term public relations, which I think is an excellent term to describe what we do in this field. Ellen, uh, can the, can, can the uh, playmaker influence decision system be used to either analyze or and or to plan strategies that are, as Professor, Professor Grunig say, it says symmetrical and collaborative, or is it by, by definition uh, asymmetrical and pers persuasion oriented? Well, the system is first and foremost descriptive. Uh, that that my first job I felt was um, uh, was to try to, uh, in some sort of uh, work of social archaeology, to try to un and disencrust and dust off what I, what I felt might be uh, you know the, the, the properly described 
um, stratagems we use to, to bend our will, whether or not it is in, uh, in a cooperative sense or whether or not it is in a directly competitive sense. I didn't so much care about that as, what, as that I wanted to try to capture the full uh, uh, a full or exhaustive set of those things and to be able to argue that each one of those, in this case we now think there are 24, are irreducibly unique. So uh, when Jim invited me a few years back uh, to lecture to one of his uh, graduate classes, he indeed, he leaned over my shoulder, he says, where are the collaborative plays? Mm -hmm. And the question, you know, was stunning, you know, because it's coming from Jim and I did have the sense that the, the first iteration of the system I developed was somewhat bilateral and, and not fundamentally uh, uh, collegial, cooperative, uh, collaborative. And so we went back at least within, contained within you know, my world and my theory. Uh, I then um, went about adding uh, a full module that allows you, as you go through this decision system, which is what it is, uh, not only to consult its benefits and its deficits of each play, or how to counter it, but in fact how to help it. So if, so if an influence strategy is empo employed by you toward Jim, and I like that, then I would be able to uh, uh, consult the system to understand then how I can use employ in influence strategies to help you uh, in your strategy toward Jim, not just simply in to help you compete against right. Jim. So what you're saying is it's both descriptive and predictive to, to a degree. You can use it to, to be predictive. Yes. Yeah. Prediction is very uh, dangerous, of course, and people generally prefer to talk about anticipation. But I do think, uh, but the, yes, the system is designed fundamentally to, to recognize uh, a strategy that is at play whether or not it's by you, for you, with you, or against you, um, but then also to figure out what to do about it. How would you then handle it? How would you reconcile it? Um, and to what end? Mm -hmm. given, given his explanation, uh, Professor Grunig, I mean, do you, do you see value in, in what Mr. Kelly's done in terms of trying to get to the irreducible elements of, of communication, if you will? Well, there are two, two things here that I would respond to. The first is when I looked at the collaborative strategies, they didn't seem to be collaborative to me. As Alan just described it, they're way, a way for him to collaborate with you vis-a-vis -vis me. Okay, okay, so that if there are others who have common objectives with me, how can I put out signals that I would like to collaborate with them? But there is nothing, say, that would allow an organization with an environmental problem who might like to engage in a relationship cultivation strategy I would call uh, networking or, or uh, sharing of tasks, which is you're interested in, in saving the environment. My company is, I probably wouldn't say it, but my company is polluting. So how can I work with you to reduce the pollution? As say McDonald's did when it was confronted by activist groups complaining about the amount of, of uh, uh, styrofoam being used in McDonald's restaurants. So they actually worked with act environmental groups and replaced it with paper and developed recycling programs and so on. So this to me is not at all captured in the ontology because I think it's still designed how can the organization uh, defend or work toward its self-interest as it thinks is its self-interest. And I'm not always sure everyone knows what his or her self-interest is and the self-interest of the organization is until they talk with others, until they interact with others. So I think that if public relations has a strategic management role in an organization, which I define as using research in to give publics a voice in the decisions that management makes, uh, I think that it's very difficult to follow such a strategy. Um, I would ask, for example, is one of the irreducible elements listening to the other side? And I don't see that one in there. Uh, now the other question is the, the question of 
ontology, is this a set of irreducible elements? And I tend to think that that's probably not possible in social sciences because social sciences are different than physical sciences. And the difference is that human beings can invent things, whereas uh, physical elements t uh, typically don't. So I've started a list of relationship cultivation strategies. Uh, for example, one is access. If you want to develop a relationship with someone, you have to give them access to, mm -hmm. to you. Another one is openness uh, and disclosure, that if I want to have a good relationship with my spouse, I should, must be able to disclose what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, the same way with an organization. And so we started w with a list of, I think, about seven or eight relationship cultivation strategies taken from interpersonal communication. And then my students started doing research with those strategies, and they discovered more. Um, being unconditionally constructive, for example. So I think that human beings are going to consistently invent new strategies. And we can continue to list them, but I don't think I would argue that we've listed everything that's possible. Gotcha. This might be a, a, a good point in time, uh, Alan, for you to sort of give us a, an example of how you would analyze a particular situation. It can either be persuasive, asymmetrical, as Professor Gruna calls it, or cooperative. And, and to, to, give, to give the viewers more of a sense of, of how the system would be applied in a sort of a descriptive, in a descriptive manner. You know, it was interesting, you, you were raised in Iowa, did you say? Right. You know, when I, uh, I was raised all over the place, but, <laughs> um, but my, you know, my professional life really began in Silicon Valley, and, and I entered there in the early 80s literally at the time when the late Steve Jobs was poking his finger in the chest of no less than IBM. And, you know, it was hard not to be influenced uh, by, by that. And it was hard uh, over the years, and as you watch Jobs and a variety of other of his contemporaries that, you know, that, that inhabit high tech, um, that you had to have some respect for, for how they did what they did, how they defined their companies and their brands, um, and, and clearly it was part of their recipe for success. And so I think that that played a very strong role as I sought to understand what I perceived to be games and gamesmanship uh, of these people. In that environment, um, it did not occur to me, and I think many of my contemporaries, that this was about cultivation. Uh, or co-orientation, that those are, those are very mature concepts for a very immature industry. So I am humbled by your, uh, you know, by, by your suggestions um, for how much more or, or how much farther my system needs to go, but I'm still nonetheless tantalized by the idea that we can and should have a, a, a stable, proven system that tells us the row and the seat number of the things we're doing, whether or not it be access or whether or not it be a stratagem I call, I don't know, a bait, for instance, like that. Um, I'm interested to know if there is another dimension and there is some way that we could merge them together or maybe they just simply collaborate side by side. But to use an example, since I mentioned Steve Jobs, uh, you know, Apple has recently been in the news um, with its rather ill-advised announcement of their own attempt at, uh, at mapping. They introduced into their, their uh, iOS 6 operating system something called Apple Maps, and they kicked out Google, Google Maps to do it. Apple Maps was not very good. It was terrible, in fact. Ultimately, over a period of days, Apple was made a series of moves to try to quell the angry masses of their fantastic, you know, customer base. And there's a couple of a couple things that they did, which which uh, are easily identified within my system. The first is that they employed a, a play or an influence strategy called the deflect, um, where a spokesperson level person said, "We really hope that people understand." Uh, and that, that they'll be patient with us 
and this is something that we'll work on and that will get better. It was sort of a, a play called a deflect and maybe to some extent a play called a recast. They're just simply trying to change the information so it suits their perspective and maybe buys them some, them some time. Well, of course, that didn't work. And so days later then, the pressure became too much. And, uh, and um, Tim Cook, the new CEO um, of Apple, was ultimately forced to flat out apologize and to acknowledge the flaw. And in the system, we have a play that is named after a strategy of parliamentary debate and it may seem like a, a strange name, but we like to honor parliamentary debate, and the, the name of the play is a disco. Insofar as Tim Cook took one step back to acknowledge a, a flaw, and then theoretically having gained some modicum of forgiveness, he could then move forward again. It's probably the play that he should have run first. Or they should have moder moderated or uh, modified somehow the way that they positioned Apple Maps uh, through a different set of influence strategies. But those are a couple simple examples of, mm -hmm. of how I can look at the system at a campaign, at uh, an advertisement, uh, at a talking points memo, at a presidential debate, mm -hmm. uh, and I can use it like a chemist does or like a biologist will use a phylo phylogenetic tree, that's, that's the goal, to understand down to an elemental or sort of atomic level, if you will, what exactly is happening? Well, Dr. Grunig mentioned a couple of minutes ago McDonald's working with and collaborating with mm -hmm. environmental groups. Can you describe a situation, uh, a case similar to that, that, that and, and use your system to sort of describe a collaborative, a collaboration, if you will, between two organizations? I suppose part of what you just described with regard to Apple was was Apple, if you will, sort of collaborating with its, cust its loyal customer base, but yeah. not quite the same thing. I'm just curious if there's another example you can give us that would, would demonstrate collaboration and how yeah. you would describe it in yeah. the system. Well, we've done a lot of work in, uh, in two sectors uh, uh, that are more and more requiring collaboration in pharmaceutical uh, business and in the energy business mm -hmm. with two notable companies. And what's interesting is that both of these uh, client companies over time have realized that, that we, can, we can map this on the system. We can realize that they, they have not been able to, to employ the same kinds of plays that Steve Jobs would toward IBM. That only increases hostility, let's say, between uh, a pharmaceutical company and, let's say, HIV activists or, or, or mommy bloggers or, you know, those people who are very, very active. Um, and usually against the interests of pharmaceuticals. So what, uh, what both uh, pharma companies and energy companies have found out is that they, in fact, have to engage much more in, in two-way and symmetric uh, dialogue, genuinely uh, understanding, genuinely empathetic uh, exchanges to wrestle their positions uh, t together. So, you know, and this is sort of what interests me about how, how or if we can, we can merge uh, excellence theory with, if, if I may say, uh, you know, influence strategy, this model that I have, so that we can have a full model. Because clearly, different companies under different circumstances, to my way of thinking, run different plays. Interesting. Do you think the two are compatible? Uh, yes, um, I do think they're compatible. I was just thinking of the, the Apple example again. and. There are two things I would say here. One thing that I'm always interested in, in, in is not just what do organizations do, but what should they do. Mm -hmm. And this is the positive versus the normative approach to theory. Now, my theories have been much in, uh, misrepresented and misunderstood by saying they're only, quote, normative theories. That is, they're what people should do, but that nobody ever really does it in that way. But the question that comes as I look at these, these plays going back and forth, the question I keep raising is, well, what should they have done? What would have been most effective? What is the outcome you're looking for? Who are we trying to influence? Is it a certain customer? Is it the opposition? Is it our, com our own company? I think it's important to sure. influence the company. So the Apple example seems to me is the classic 
example of a company that decides to do something without consulting its publics first and then finds that it's a big mess and then they have to cover it up and try to re realign their policy. Uh, I can't quite describe the, the, the plays that they're using. Mm -hmm. But the question, why didn't they talk with consumers before they released Apple Maps? Perhaps they did and they didn't do it well, but this is the whole idea. It's, I think if we expend, extend this beyond the marketing of new products into, say, uh, closing a plant in a community, building a road through a suburb, uh, laying off employees, all sorts of things that company do, companies do that have negative consequences True. on publics. Uh, then we need to have a strategy where we listen to them, we, we take their interest into account, we don't necessarily do we don't cave into them or accommodate them, but at least we take their interest into account when decisions are made. And then you don't have to, if you listen to the public before decisions are made and not just to get a reaction to well, how they reacted to your idea or to your initiative, then we make better decisions in the first place and those decisions are in the self-interest of the company, more so than just trying to defend a position it takes or a product it releases or, or an action it takes that may not, may have uh, negative consequences for publics. I see. Is there, is there a, there's not a stratagem in your system, I don't believe, called listening, but I mean, is, is, is not listening suggested by some of the plays in your, in your table? Uh, there, the, one of the systems in the, in the influence decision system, um, it, it has to do with cycles. We have two different types of cycles where we have player A and player B and how they interact, and it's, it's called our basic cycle of influence. And then there is, uh, I guess what you might call a trilateral, trilateral or a tricyclic model where you've got the focal player uh, in the middle who is then interacting with collaborators, competitors, um, and, um, and uh, independents. And, and, uh, and, and in a simulated environment, by the way, it's very interesting. But no matter how you cut it, in any of those cycles, whether it's the two-on-two two or the one-on-three, um, there is, uh, in, in our schematic, um, three or four places in which research can and should be done which I believe is a form of, of listening. Um, uh, so, you know, if, if a play is, quote, run or occurs in an environment, then the focal player then has to consider what has happened. Well, then, so research has to happen at that phase. Mm -hmm. They then cons consult the system for what might be advisably um, the, the best strategies to use. And then I think they have to simulate it, which is a form of research, and then they have to execute it. And then they have to start listening again. Mm -hmm. So to me, um, listening is not a strategy. Uh, we do have stratagems in the system called passing and pausing. But to me, those are different. I, I think that basically the notion of research, however it's done by whatever vehicles, primary, secondary, so on and so forth, um, happen at each of the phases of the cycles that we've attempted to articulate. It's, a, it's important to distinguish what kind of research is yes. being done because there's asymmetrical research which say political candidates do. They Very test a message to yeah. see, so if I say this, would you? how would you react if I say this yes. and this and so on. So yes. they always try out messages or yeah. symbolic strategies to see which might be more effective and if they find one is most effective then they develop talking points and then we hear the same thing over and over again ad nauseum. So I would like research not just to test out my own ideas, but as a way of formulating my own ideas, right. or formulating the, the decisions of the company in the first place. So it's important, and I'm not sure where if in your system research fits into both those categories, but I do think most research in the industry is done to in an evaluation sense, just to see if we accomplished what we set out to accomplish, but not in a formative sense to help develop decisions and policies. Well, com in the first coming place. from industry, and uh, you know, it, it, it is very clear that industry's definition of research is sometimes very purposive, you know, and, and can be uh, almost self-serving. And uh, I, I don't think it's up to me to, to try to explain or re-explain good social science research. 
but there should within our cycles be plenty of room for it to be done well and right, and we hope that it would be. I'd like to get back to this question that you used the terms, Professor Gurney, normative and positive, and I guess I'd, I'd, I'd turn to you, Alan, and ask, you know, you've, you've said to me a number of times that, that you are trying to describe what is, not what should be, with, with your system. Um, having said that, is there, can there, w would you see a normative role uh, for your for your system in in the in the, in the way that Professor Gurney described described his his theories as, as being regarded as more normative than positive in, in, in some instances. Well, that, they're both normative they're both, I understand, and positive. I understand yes. because a good normative theory is one that you can provide evidence that it actually works, works. in practice. Right. So what I'm looking for is the question of what would you recommend to mm -hmm. a client right. when something occurs? What is going right. to right be most effective, right. however you define that, and I'm not sure how you define that. Right, okay. Well, uh, there, there are two questions on the table that speak to um, two sides of me, I suppose. One is as the, 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 uh, the principal investigator you know, of the system, and the other is as an interpreter of it, as a consultant. And I am in business, and I do sell products and services based on the system, so I, I clearly do have a, a view um, and it varies by, by, you know, by case, but I probably generally do have a view for how to apply it. Um, each of the influence strategies that we've described um, is rated. Uh, we, we, have, we have taken to, um, through, I, through a process that I can't recall right now, but, but, um, but we've tried to responsibly rate both the transparency levels mm -hmm the relative transparency levels of each play, and the risks and rewards of each. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the risks and rewards are what's, what can be pretty interesting here and what is potentially an intersection for us because I think if you look mm -hmm. at a play that we call the red herring, which is a distraction device, you throw a red herring you know, away from the direction you're going mm -hmm. so they'll go that way, clearly there are, clearly that's a high risk uh, influence strategy to employ, and clearly it's not symmetric. Um, and so you could, you, could look, you could look at, uh, you could do an analysis of each of the 24 and try to understand which are the high risk plays and start to understand, okay, that's more symmetrical, that's more asymmetrical, and so on and so forth. Now as it relates to how I, uh, how I counsel, um, I'll admit to you that I am probably more of a competitivist than I am a collaborativist uh, to use those, and be, it's because of where I come from. I come from Silicon Valley, and and you know I, I learn at the knee, and I advise at the elbows of of uh, kind of cowboy marketers, if you will, who are trying to create market share, who are trying to drive innovations into markets, very young markets, and so I am more inclined uh, toward what I suppose may be um, asymmetric approaches or even one-way approaches. Uh, because in that environment, I believe it tends to work. Um, but I'm probably not so skilled, you know, in more mature industries that have um, more complex um, uh, you know, variations of, of, of many, many different competing publics. What do you mean by work, quote unquote? Work? Work. That implies some kind of outcome. So what is the outcome that occurs that made you say it works? It would depend on the client um, the, uh, and, and the matter at hand. Um, but in, in the environments that I've advised in, uh, what you want is um, some, sen some measurable sense or knowable sense that an idea is dominating over others, that a criteria, uh, that your criteria for purchase uh, or for selection of something is dominating over others, that um, you are positioned optimally as better and that a competitor is positioned less so. There, I think, um, again, in the environment to which I am so well adjusted very often has to do with um, you know, competitive advantage and relative competitive advantage. My clients tend to want to know, am I in front of that guy? And that, is, that may offend your sensibilities uh, or go against the grain of the excellence theory. Um, 
but that is that is honestly uh, the sort of situations that I tend to counsel in because a client will need to be quite literally ahead in whether it's financial or it's market share or it's mind share. They want to have a relative competitive advantage as gained through the strategies that we advise on. Well, I tend to think that one gets ahead or is able to compete most effectively when you have relationships with your publics, whether they be your employees, your consumers, the community, the government, fi uh, investors, and so on. If you have a good relationship with them, you gain competitive advantage over your competitors because those relationships are very difficult to take away. Once you develop relationships, they're, they're very important. So there is an axiom in, in marketing, you know, it's easier to keep a customer than to gain a customer. Yeah. So I tend to think that I'm not sure I want to come back to how you measure whether those outcomes occur, whether sure. your idea is dominating, yeah. whether it is, is it through media exposure that you're measuring this, or is it through purchases, or is it surveys of attitudes? Do they prefer your product over another one? Or how do you actually measure those outcomes that you're interested in? Well, you, any and all of those ways. It, it, it always, it's always client dependent. It, 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 it but does the client know what to measure? Well, the client sometimes need to be edu needs to be educated to measure. Right. The clients are sometimes happy if viscerally they think something has happened. Uh, and, you know, I have some background in that and I, and I usually do try to convince them that they need to have some assurances. They need to establish a baseline. They need to have a criteria that they're measuring against. They need to know who exactly they're measuring or under what circumstances. And then we need to have a steady protocol that we use, not just the first time, but the second and third and fourth. So that can happen uh, through uh, you know, Boolean logic searches over, over media. It can happen through uh, focus groups. It can happen through private information or, or semi-public channels, like for instance, subscription newsletters are often an interesting source. Um, but nowadays, we're also measuring uh, the content of, of Twitters, mm -hmm. of tweets mm -hmm. and posts. Right. Because each of them, uh, if you understand the context, you can drive from them, again, to use my terminology, the plays that are being run. I think that digital media also offer an enormous opportunity for learning and listening, Absolutely. which I think public relations people and probably marketing people yeah. uh, too often do not use. They tend to think of creating buzz or likes or, or discussion and so on without stepping back and just monitoring through search engines or, or whatever. It's something as simple as a Google search to see what uh, what people are thinking about and how they're reacting and so on, instead of just assuming that the more attention there is to my company, uh, the better it is for me. You know, one of the things that occurs to me is that um, is that in the, the maintenance of relationships, the cultivation of relationships is undoubtedly important. But what I've seen in my career um, are, are situations where it appears to be useful to in fact find a foil, to find uh, something or some person or some topic that you disagree with in order to offset and to punctuate what you are about as a, let's say a company. So if I'm coming out with a better microprocessor uh, based on some sort of uh, new technology, I can talk about that and I can cultivate relationships amongst people or organizations who think my technology is good. But in order to really create real interest and real discussion and higher relevance, it often pays off um, to find the inferior microprocessor architecture so that you can compare the two. Now, that is marketing-wise useful, but I would have to say that as you, if you find that foil Sometimes we use the phrase repositioning or even depositioning. Then you're 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 almost you're cultivating, in fact, negative relationships you're, for the other guy. Yeah, you're <laughs> you're doing something that's that's not only different, but in fact, almost exactly right. against what excellence theory is all about. So I don't. And I can look at that, and I can I can know that that works. But I but that's why I have an orientation. I respect relationships, 
but frankly, I can sometimes advise a client to create, literally create, a negative relationship in order to create relevance and interest. That's obviously what's going on in the presidential election. It's, yes, it it's is. It's only a week away <laughs> in which uh, Obama in particular is trying to to paint Romney as such a negative alternative that no one would want to have a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting because when it comes to something like an election, I haven't quite figured out how to run a symmetrical campaign <laughs> yet. Uh, let me, let me but add. it would be interesting to, mm -hmm. uh, to try. I think it, a symmetrical campaign would be almost, if you will, to ignore the opposition and try to find out what the, your, the publics who are likely to vote for you know, it's entirely possible that yeah. you simply cannot cultivate sure. the relationship. Well, the, the research people. question is, does, uh, does asymmetry catch up with a player? Oh, hours. At some point. Right, always. Right. <laughs> uh, because asymmetry is always, I think, equated with not telling the whole truth. It's mm -hmm. usually not, not lying, but you only emphasize those aspects of your product, say, that you think will appeal to your customer, say, if we're talking about marketing, such as we used to be called a unique selling proposition. Right. But then you get the product and you find out all of the bad things that it does as well. And if you haven't owned up to them, uh, then the relationship is going to deteriorate. So that's where I think disclosure is a wonderful thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that you go out and tell all the bad things about your product, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you try to find out what those are ahead of time and deal with them. Uh, <coughs> so that you can eliminate as many of them as possible, and then you disclose what you've done to fix the problems. Taking taking a, a, a broad view, um, in your 30, 40 years of you know since you really developed the models, have you, are you hopeful? Do you see with some of the new technologies, with the internet, with others, are, are public relations practitioners practicing more s symmetrical communication, or you know did those the, the positive side of your of your theories are they still uh, are you, uh, I shouldn't say still pessimistic, but are you still, uh, uh, are you still looking at, looking at the profession and saying we're not doing enough symmetrical communication? Well, we're not engaged. the first thing that happens when a new medium is introduced is that people use it the way they use the old medium. And for example, when television was first introduced, uh, people just read the news in front of the TV camera without realizing they could use pictures. And there are many other examples of this. So the first thing that happened when the internet came about is that people continued to use it as an information dump. Uh, and the thought is all of how much information can I get out there? How, and, you know, how much positive symbolism can I create, and so on. Uh, but the unique nature of, of, sci of digital media is interaction. And I think it, it's inevitable that symmetrical approaches will be used because you simply cannot use anything else very effectively with digital media. You cannot control the information that goes to people. They can get information whenever they, wherever they want. So if for example, there's a crisis and you don't disclose what happened, they'll find it out someplace else on the internet. Um, if there are negative parts of your product, I, I won't buy any product without searching all of the des discussions thoroughly. And it amazes <laughs> me that companies don't deal with what's on the internet when they're told that a dehumidifier wears out within six months or, or that washing machines don't wash anymore since they're high efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, that they would deal with this or at least open a dialogue to explain about these sorts of things. So I think that there is still a great deal of asymmetrical communication going on, but I don't think it can be effective. And this is why I continue to come back, you know, what do we advise people to do? What is going to be effective in the sense that it's going to, well, first you have to uh, make people aware of something, you know, whatever it is you're sure. communicating about, you have to influence their cognitions, what they think about it, their attitudes, how they evaluate it, and their behavior of what they do. So all of this is, you know, in a sense, 
the same thing we do when we develop relationships. We use communication in some way. So I want to know both ways. You know, is management aware of what publics are thinking? Is management thinking able to reproduce and understand cognitively what publics are thinking? Do they tend to agree that publics may be right and then behave in a way that's in the interest of publics? In this, you can also look at a co-orientational framework, which we might call accuracy, agreement, mm -hmm. uh, and so on, and or mutual behavior of ways of describing what we used to describe as asymmetrical kinds of effects. But the thing I would like to ask Alan, I think I would put, if I took the periodic table, you've done, you've got advantages and disadvantages, and I think these are ways of, of counseling. If you, you might think, oh, I really want to do that. The competitor said this, so I want to respond in kind, but the disadvantage might be such, so I wouldn't do that. Right. And I think this is getting into the normative element. What is most effective and what is right. least effective, right. and right. what would I recommend that you do? But I would like to add an ethical component to this. Mm -hmm. Which of these strategies are ethical, which are not e yeah. are ethical, and therefore, as a, a professional communication counselor, I really can't say you should do something that is unethical. So I'm wondering if you've thought, well, I know you've said to me that there are certain of these these modules that yeah. are stratagems yeah. that are indeed unethical. Yeah. So have you thought about well, I think classifying them? More often than of not, methods? there are a few that, that are unethical. Like to bait someone, again, to use that red herring, mm -hmm. uh, there's a play we call a call-out, which really is, is just simply a, almost a statement of, of unvarnished insult. You know, there, clearly there's an ethical equation there that rises a little bit higher. There's a, that should go to a, a red light from a yellow light, mm -hmm. if you will. And so we've thought about within our software system, because we were able to now move this into an app mm -hmm. form, we've thought about, uh, and we may well, um, add some sort of um, lighting system or rating system so that if you alight on a particular recommendation, then you're reminded, careful. Mm -hmm. um, but that is why that we have taken the time to outline the risks, much less the rewards, but particularly the risks of any play, and to, and to outline the, the downsides of a particular play. And I think there's probably a, currently a third um, buffer there that might suggest to uh, a practitioner to be careful, and that is that any time you go into, going into any particular play, if you want to counter that play, there are going to be uh, probably at least five, maybe six or seven uh, uh, prescriptives or tips for what to do. And if you read any of those online, you'll see that there is most definitely a spectrum of sort of play safe or play nice or even play mean. That we're trying to give um, you know, practitioners a range of ideas. The whole, the whole point, one of the whole points of the system is to calibrate them so that they can understand much more qu quickly the nature of the environment that they're being forced to react to and then how to do it well. And hopefully, I think to your point, ethically. Is there any set kind of probability that if, if your opponent does this and you have three options, what are the probabilities of what the opponent will do if you do each one of these? Is there any kind of chain of, of consequences that t tells you what is likely to happen if you do one thing versus the other? Right now, um, that sort of information resides uh, in, in the heads of the people who work at my company mm -hmm. and our experience. Um, I think with the benefit of things like what they call big data, and really good analytic solutions and machine, uh, over time these plays will be machine readable. Mm -hmm. And so we, will, we should be able to, to say that uh, the, the invocation of a play called a lantern, where you admit something in advance, can have a material benefit by some number. Mm -hmm. um, but we have 1,004 uh, prescriptives and tips related to the 24 plays. So uh, right now, 
we don't know. It's too much. <laughs> but I think over time we will. We're, we've already kind of segued into the, the, the final segment of our discussion, um, and I guess I'd like to, to, to kick off the final part of that discussion with that. Alan, you talked about uh, the, the, current, the current version of the, the Playmaker system is what you call 2.0. What will 3.0 look like? What, what's, what's in the future uh, for it? And Professor Gruden, I'd like you to give uh, Mr. Mr. Kelly perhaps some advice on how he ought to continue to refine this uh, from a research perspective since we are speaking to the, to the readers of the International Journal of Communication. Well, I think we probably touched, uh, we probably have previewed um, you know, aspects of 3.0 or 4.0 or whatever. Or I, mean, whatever I, I, I absolutely acknowledge uh, that, that this system, while it, I think it's arguably the first of its kind, is certainly not uh, the last in its own form and I certainly welcome and expect other ontologies or structures or frameworks to enter in. I, if, it's, if, if ours is any good, others should come. Um, so I think there probably should be uh, some analytics to outline ethics. I think that you're going to see machine readability so that you can know more quickly the plays that are being run and to what end. I, uh, in some, some work that we're doing with Booz Allen right now, we believe that there's a possibility to create a self-learning uh, decision system. Hmm. Um, certainly we can add translations. We have dabbled in Spanish and German and uh, Mandarin uh, on this application. Those are daunting. We know enough to know that it's possible. <laughs> Have you found um, cultural differences? Are there d different plays in different cultures? Yeah. Certainly. There are uh, the, you know, the tendencies, let's say, the uh, Asian tendencies are what I would call to, to, to run plays that are more left-sided, lower engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Germans, for instance, and I'm caving to massive uh, stereotypes, which <laughs> is very dangerous, but, but Germans, for instance, uh, love a play called The Mirror. The mirror is like a call out with facts. It doesn't say, hey, you know, you're not a nice guy, but it says, you did this, 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 and this on February 13th. You I know, heard that in the presidential debate. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, you heard every play in the presidential <laughs> debate. So. You know, what's interesting is that uh, we, we have offered uh, workshops and, and courses on four major continents now with this system, mm -hmm. and we, we have seen absolutely um, how uh, culture or traditions or laws will modify the use of the plays, but we have not seen, um, uh, and I hope I'm objective, but we, we have not seen um, that a situation where a play literally doesn't exist, let's say in Colombia where you studied, or versus let's say Germany. Um, we think the plays, and this is part of our, our ambition, is if we play, we think that we have a uniform set of the existent influence strategies in business, politics, pop culture, and academia. Um, it certainly varies, but we think we have it. There is a concept in Asia called saving face mm -hmm. that's extremely important. Is, do you think that is a play that should be added to the system? We've talked about saving face and whether or not that's an irreducible strategy. It, it wouldn't be in the United States, probably, but it yeah. probably would be in, yeah. in China and Japan and other yeah. Asian countries. I don't quite have an answer for you. We we uh, we have talked about it. We we think that we think that the notion of saving face has probably a lot more to do with framing framing plays, what we call within the framing subclass, and much more in the testing subtle plays like trial balloons and pings where you're constantly, especially pings where you're tr constantly trying to suggest something in order to make what might be to that culture an adamant point. Mm -hmm. So, Interesting. Well, Professor uh, Grudy, do you have any other advice for, for Alan uh, in terms of refining, ter looking forward? Um, I think you've gone over some Well, the these. main thing is that I would like to almost have a two-dimensional model of such stratagems uh, one of which is symmetrical and one of which is asymmetrical and it's possible, I, I don't know your system as well as you do, that if you did this, that many of these uh, plays are both uh, symmetric, could be either symmetrical or asymmetrical, others aren't. 
but then thinking, are there other plays that are purely symmetrical could it uh, be, that you should put in there? Could you attach ratings to them in terms of their symmetry, or is it to you binary? It's, it is symmetrical or it's not, or are there gradations thereof? Could we grade well, them? I think the, the major difference is whether the person using a play is thinking about the interest of the people he or she is dealing with, not just the competitor, but the pe I mean, ultimately you're not communicating to your competitor, you're, com you're com communicating to the community, the customers, the employees, or whatever they are, that you need to have a relationship with in order to get their business, their loyalty, uh, and so on. So I don't, I, I wouldn't say, well, there are a number of things, but mostly, let's say, if you look at conflict resolution st strategies, there's one called accommodation, which is an asymmetrical strategy, and I don't see any way you could make it symmetrical. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, another one called be, uh, be unconditionally constructive, which I don't see how that could be an asymmetrical strategy, unless you're only doing it as a form of pseudo-symmetry, that is, trying to appear to be interested in the other person when you really have no intention of listening to them or, or making a change. But so, so if, we could, if we could determine consideration or considerativeness <laughs> of, of a player using, employing an influence strategy, that might be helpful then. Yeah, I think that's ultimately what we're talking about. Okay. What is what is their their purpose in communicating? And again, I think these all are about well, some of it is obviously about strategy or marketing strategy, not yeah. just communication. Okay, but what are why are they doing this? Is it purely self-interest, or is it is it? Uh, symmetrical interest and so I have to be very clear that I, okay. I don't mean that self-interest and the interest of a public are mutually exclusive. Uh, I believe it's in the self-interest of an organization to behave in a way that does not have negative consequences for a public or that secures positive consequences that that public would want. So that's what we do when we develop a better product we are developing a product that has positive consequences for the person who uses it. But if there are negative consequences, yeah. we need to learn about what those are and not try to cover them up when we market the product for to them, for example. And we can only learn that by having people try out the product or doing formative research and so on. Are you giving me a new idea? Okay. There you go. Another challenge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, uh, Mr. Alan Kelly, thank you very much for, for illuminating us on the, uh, on the Playmaker Influence Decision System. Professor James Grunig, thank you, sir, for, uh, for your, your cogent analysis. This has been a special video presentation of the International Journal of Communication. We thank you all very much. Goodbye.